Thank you, Chairman Pallone, <clears throat> Mr. Upton, members of the committee for the invitation to speak today about some important issues facing my community. Uh, Minnesota is fortunate to be home to many pristine waters and natural treasures, including the Mississippi River, our infamous 10,000 lakes, and those are just ones with names, and the Boundary Waters. The Boundary Waters is the most visited wilderness in our country and a special place for Minnesotans and many throughout our nation. People from across the world also visit to canoe and hike and to fish. In May, the Department of <clears throat> the Interior decided to renew two mining leases for a proposed copper sulfide mine right on the edge of the Boundary Waters. Despite scientific evidence, economic data, ongoing litigation, and a public record of opposition dating back over 50 years. This unilateral action from the Trump administration to move forward on the copper sulfide twin metals mine is irresponsible and unacceptable. We must continue to protect our public lands and waters and ensure that Minnesota's and the nation's wilderness areas can be enjoyed by future generations. Minnesota's third district is home to one of the most visited lakes in our state, Lake Minnetonka, made famous by Prince's movie, Purple Rain. I'm sure that's the first time that's been uttered in this room. <laughs> Right now, Lake Minnetonka and the rest of our state's waters face the grave threat of aquatic invasive species, something to which my colleague from Wisconsin referred to just moments ago. Aquatic invasive species include Asian carp, spiny water fleas, and zebra mussels, none of them native to Minnesota, and all of which cause major harm to our water's ecosystems. These species have been moving throughout Minnesota, clogging our lakes and rivers, and killing off native animals and plants. Life in our district revolves around these lakes, so this problem is of grave concern to our community. In June, I convened a roundtable of local experts to discuss the threat posed by these invasive species, and the consensus was very clear. Congress must invest resources and support state and local governments to prevent the further spread of invasive species in our lakes and our rivers. And unfortunately, the problem of aquatic invasive species is exasperated by our changing climate. Invasive species can now live in water maze ways that were uninhabitable just a few decades ago, while native species are struggling to adapt fast enough to compete with them. Climate change is right in our backyards, and it is time to act. I hear it from my constituents every day, middle and high school students in particular, who contact my office to express their distress that our federal government has refused to take bold steps or any meaningful action to solve this issue. These young people are motivated to organize and contact their representatives because they feel it is their only option. Their life and future depends on it. And I also hear from their parents and their grandparents, worried about the world they will leave behind for their families. Climate change is complex and requires a multi-pronged approach. We need to consider solutions and policies like federal support for research and development of renewable energy, extending and supporting new tax credits for renewables, supporting consumer purchase of electric vehicles, and other thoughtful proposals. Another policy we need to explore is placing a price on carbon, like the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act. This legislation places a fee on fossil fuels at the source, beginning with at $15 per metric ton of CO2 equivalent emissions, and steadily increases annually by $10 per metric ton. The fees would be deposited into a carbon dividend trust fund and allocated as dividend payments to all U.S. citizens and lawful residents. Thus, the bill would use market forces to provide incentives for the reduction of carbon emissions. This is an achievable solution that both parties can support and should, and I urge all who are present to consider doing so. The American people have sent a clear message to Congress. Please take action on climate change. And I hope you'll join me in doing all that we can to keep our planet safe and prosperous for generations to come. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And I did want to mention that just this week, uh, myself, Mr. Tonko, and um, Mr. Rush, we had an, uh, we had we made an announcement earlier this week um, that we were going to try to uh, achieve a goal of 100%. Um, uh, you know. I guess I'll say carbon neutral by 2050, and that we were going to begin a series of hearings, uh, which actually started yesterday in Mr. Tonko, the Environment and Climate Change Subcommittee, uh, to see what legislative proposals uh, that we have before the committee or others, with the idea that by the end of the year, if not sooner, we would come up with legislation, you know, sort of a climate action plan, if you will, uh, that we would then try to sell to the rest of not only Democrats, but Republicans as well. So we certainly want to look at your proposal in the context of that, and Thank we you. will. 
And Mr. Chair, if I might say, you know, we're in this together, and to the extent that we can identify best practices as practiced by other countries, uh, in many cases ahead of us on this issue, I would encourage. Right, and it's true. Us. We mentioned that, um, you know, the scientific community basically says that by 2050, if we don't, you know, if we don't take action now to get to carbon neutral by 2050, we're going to have a catastrophe. Indeed. And several countries have used that uh, date. You know, France, Germany, Japan, and others. Uh, did you want to? I just want to say thank you, Mr. Phil, for, for being here. And um, I know Minnesota is known as the land of 10,000 lakes. Michigan has more. I, I knew that was coming. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but last year I went down the, uh, the Paw Paw River, which is a, a merges into, into Lake Michigan. And when you take the jigs and jogs, it's, you go about 35 miles inland from Lake Michigan, and you actually get 100 miles of river because it goes like this. And uh, we were working on identifying the uh, lamprey eel larva and, and eggs. And that's how far we went up to look at the lamprey side that then forced the, the, the younglings of the lamprey eels uh, to surface and then were able to collect. And of course, that has been an issue that we've had in the Great Lakes for Long time. many decades. And that's why it's so important as we look at Asian carp and other invasive species that came in maybe with ballast water, I think with exactly. the, with, with those eels, lamprey eels, but uh, it's a tremendous uh, impact on the fisheries and tourism and everything else. And, uh, can, and when you look at zebra mussels as well, a huge issue for all of us. Huge. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks Thank you, again. Appreciate your being here.